Okay, so can art transform life? Well, we're going to ask this question. I'm going to try and answer it a little bit for you. Um, I'm going to show you a few pieces of work that you might, uh, might help you make your mind up. Okay, Jaya, by two th in, made in 2009 by Chris Jordan. Um, this is a takeoff of the Hokusai Great Wave off Kanagawa. Jordan recreated the image. Uh, he recreated it with 2.4 million pieces of plastic. These pieces of plastic are equal to the estimated number of pounds of plastic pollution that enter the world's oceans every hour. All of the plastic in this image was collected from the Pacific Ocean. Chris Jordan is a photographer. He's trained in the Arts College system. He exhibits in galleries. He used a range of different skills and media to come to this piece of work. The, piece of, the, the work was curated in an art gallery by a curator, part of the great art machine of the modern world. The next piece, however, is very different. This is an Aboriginal Balamundi painting from the Torres Strait Islands. Can you guess how many years old it could be? Maybe 20,000, 15,000 years old? The secret's in the bird. This is a replica of the bird in the Australian Museum of Natural History. The thing about this bird is that it was extinct maybe 40,000 years ago. That means that the people who made this picture had to have known what this bird looked like in order to make the drawing realistic. Was there an art school here at this time? Was there a curator for this show? Was there a great art machine? No. And this is my point, is that we often feel that we can't be creative because we have it drummed out of us at school. We're told that we don't know how to be artistic unless we've been taught. Some people have a natural talent, but they're the special ones. The rest of us can't draw, can't create, and so slowly have it drummed out of us, and we forget about it. But a man called Robert Rune Bernstein has identified 13 tools of creative thinking, and this list gives us a bit of hope. Here they are. Observing. We can only gain knowledge by observing whatever it is that is interesting to us. We learn how to recall and remember and retain that knowledge by imaging. And I don't mean drawing, but I mean in our heads. The sensory world that we inhabit is so rich and powerful that we have to abstract in order to be able to contain it. In order to be able to engage with nature and understand nature's elements in all their glory, from physics and astrology and astronomy right down to microbiology, we have to be able to recognize patterns. And through recognizing patterns, we're then able to form patterns and make sense of what we're presented with. And from recognizing and forming patterns, we are able to analogize what these things can mean for us. 
And finally, we, body thinking is, is a sense of thinking where we use our physical senses, our gut feelings, our um, sensory experiences to allow us to think even before we thought cognitively or intellectually. And from that body thinking comes our ability to empathize. Because it's only by feeling that we can actually feel enough to be able to empathize with people and other things. Dimensional thinking allows us to create more form and, and conceive possibilities. And modeling will combine body thinking and dimensional thinking to give things form. Playing allows us to question the givens and to explore new possibilities. Transforming is the ability that we have to take all of the previous skills and turn them into something else that is significant. And finally, synthesizing creates things and pulls all of them all together into a whole that has a significance for not only us, but for others. These 13 critical tools, I don't believe that we have evolved into. I think that they are equally visible in the picture of the genionis, the bird, the 40,000-year-old bird. Um, we, we are still, we have not evolved into less visual or less creative or less conceptual people over this time. Therefore, two things come to us. One is that anybody can do this. And two is that it can have a significant effect on our lives. I want to talk to you now a little bit about a room 13. Has anybody heard of room 13 here? No? OK. In a little primary school in south, uh, northwest Scotland, in Fort William, room 13 is a room where the children are in charge. In about 1995, this, the primary school got some money to have an artist in residence, which means an artist doesn't come to teach, but comes to sit in the school and be an artist. And then whatever consequences arrive from that is allowed to happen. The children interact, but they're not taught by the teacher, the, by the artist. So this particular artist, Rob Farley, came to this school with these children and he discovered that they weren't, they weren't very sure about drawing. They were frightened of drawing. So he gave them disposable cameras to go out and take pictures of the school and their lives. They took those cameras and they produced some, some really amazing pictures. When he left, they were very dismayed because his, his residency was only one year long and they wanted him to stay. But he said, I can't stay because nobody is paying me. So they went out then and hijacked the school photography system, which is where they, you take a picture of your darling in first grade and then second grade and then third grade and they slowly build up on your wall and um, you have a, a, a series of flying photographs along your wall of all your darlings at every point in their school career. They actually got themselves a camera, they set up a dark room, and they started to take photographs. And this is the children, not the adults. They started to take photographs of all the children in the school. They photographed them, they developed them, they mounted them, and then they sold them to the parents. And they bought enough, they, they sold enough to produce some money to buy a camera, a professional camera and a tripod. And they started up a photography club. Well, this is 10 years ago, so. They then began to get local commissions and they started to um, do a little bit of work for other people. This is during the school time. And after a while, they managed to get another grant to have another, um, uh, another artist in residence. Who then, and then the school gave them a spare room called Room 13. 
and room 13 was set up as an artist studio in which the children were in charge and the adults had nothing to do with it. So with these commissions and things, they became, um, they got a little bit of money. They went um, on to hire another artist. They set up a management committee. They opened a bank account. They started to learn about commercial artistic activities. On September the 11th, 2000, uh, September the 11th, 2001, Jody was ill and stayed at home for the day. That meant that she saw the attack on the Twin Towers. The next day she came into school and she was so upset and horrified by that attack that she said, and I quote, I want to make a work that will make everyone want to cry. So she was helped in the, in the room to, to do this. And this is the resulting um, canvas. It was a canvas of, I'll go back to that in a minute. It was a canvas made up of 3,000 matches of which a bonfire was made in the school grounds. And every single match was collected and then arranged on the canvas in a pattern of her choosing. So each match represents one person who was killed during that attack. A year later, the piece of work was down in London in an exhibition and it won the Barbie Prize, which is the junior equivalent of the Turner Prize, which is an extremely prestigious adult art exhibition. I want to talk a little bit outside of art education and art, art experience for these children because there's some research that has been done by Dr. Misty Adonio in the University of Canberra, who discovered, she's followed on from a bit of research in the 1990s that showed that if you can teach, you can allow children to draw essays before they write them, their writing improves considerably. These were um, um, descriptive narrative essays that they were writing. So Dr. Misty, decided to see if it was possible to use the same techni techniques for um, procedural writing. And so she gave this, the children, her children, the, they, these were children learning English as a second language, um, a lesson on how to make pikelets. And then she asked them to write a procedural piece about how to make pikelets. And her control group, half of them just read a book and half of them were actually allowed to draw pictures. What they discovered was that drawing the pictures before they actually wrote the piece considerably improved their contextual, um, their word and the comprehension in their writing as compared to the control group. So I think the thing is that um, we've got these 13 skills that are innate in us. Ooh. We've got these 13 skills that are, sorry, that's my hand that are innate in us, and, um, but they don't, they don't replace uh, other forms of cognitive skills. However, if we aren't teaching our children creative thinking skills, the analogizing, the, the um, imaging, abstracting, body thinking, etc., etc., we then fail to teach them that we fail to produce creative thinkers in later life. My feeling is that anybody can do this, whatever we've been taught or told as a child. So what I want to do is a little bit of an experiment with you for the last couple of minutes. Could you stand up for me, please? Can you put your hands out in front of you like this? Hold your finger and your thumbs together. Now start to make some movements in the air and maybe do one arm and maybe another and then a little bit of a wiggle down here. And then take your finger and pretend that your finger is a pencil and that in front of you there is a sheet of paper. Okay, and you're going to now draw with your finger and you're going to do some waves. 
maybe even perhaps the wave of Hokusai, or that bird. You are now drawing. You are now using the creative thinking skills that you had to, you could, okay, you can stop now. <laughs> You're now using the creative thinking, some of the creative thinking skills that I was talking about earlier on. So you had to be able to image something in your head, to abstract it a little bit, to do some body thinking, and to do a little bit of transforming and synthesizing. My point is that if these children can do it, so can we. So I'm going to leave you with an Aboriginal philosoph philosophical point. Life is a journey of becoming. So let's all go out and become creative. Thank you.